Good morning. Hey, you, once more, good morning. You are there? Ah, good. Okay. Well, I hope you're having a great summer. It's getting close to the end. I'm surprised how fast it has gone. We've been away for quite a while this summer, and we are so glad to be back in our church today. We went back to Calgary, where I was before, and we realized when we were there, it's not home anymore. It's here, and we missed you people, and it was so good to come back and to get acquainted with the people that I, I've met many of you, and some I don't remember your names, but it's a great place, and I'll keep asking you. While we were away, uh, I read some books, and uh, I love to read when I'm away, and, and I had two books that my wife got for me, and the amazing thing to me was the emphasis and the takeaway for me was God loves me unconditionally. It probably is the most profound thing that I have ever come up against, and I come up against it over and over and over again. And my prayer today is, as we worship together, that you will come in a new awareness of his love. There is nothing like it. You're safe, you're secure, you're free when you know you're loved. So God bless you, and uh, we're excited about this morning. I have some family matters for you, and uh, the first one is one that we get almost all the time, and it's, it's, I, I think you're ignoring it. The communication card right in front of you. And, you know, we like to hear from you. If you have something that you want to say to one of the staff, uh, put it on the card there. A prayer request, put it on the card. And if you're new here, like new means you've been, you know, the last two or three months sort of thing, but you've never filled out a card and taken it to the Welcome Center, please do it today because I'm going to be in the Welcome Center today and I'm going to be looking for you. So fill it in, bring me the card, and we have a gift for you. A wonderful thing. And, and 
I'd love to meet you and talk with you. Now, I just realized something yesterday that was a real shock to me. It's 130 days till Christmas from right now. Christmas Day is 130 days away. Now, I haven't been thinking about it, but we have people in our church who are thinking about it, because Five Corners Christmas, you'll see a, an incredible insert in your bulletin. They're looking for actors, and they, they already have additions coming up, and all that information is in there. Please take a look at it and consider it. You know, you maybe just have wonderful talents you've never discovered yet. Uh, so think about it seriously. Uh, we are happy to announce that, that Bronwyn Gray and Austin Wolf submitted scholarship applications for this year, and they've both been accepted. And Bronwyn is in her fourth year at Moody Bible College in Chicago, and Austin is entering his second year at Columbia Bible College. I think that we should clap for that. Now the next thing, would you pray for them? Remember these, our, our young people who are in school and uh, that God would bless them richly. Video Cafe starts next week. Hey, fall is coming. For those of you who have enjoyed Video Cafe in the past, I want to encourage you to go back into the gym next week. And maybe you've never tried it and you say, you know, I don't know what's going on over there. Well, drop in and, and uh, check it out. It's a great time. We're excited about that. S last thing, Alpha begins on September the 17th. This is our gift to you to help you with those for that lost people, those lost people in your life. Bring them along. Stay with them. Uh, it's amazing what God does through Alpha. So keep it in mind. You'll be hearing more about it. Now it's greeting time. So I want you to try and find someone you haven't met before, okay? And greet them. I'd hate to interrupt this, but once again, good morning and welcome here. We're going we're gonna to spend some time singing, singing songs of praise, and uh, I just want to open up with a scripture, and I've used this, this scripture actually a few times, but this one just introduces this first song that we're going to do called Yours, Yours Will Be. Um, it just sort of introduces it quite well, and um, actually the last line of the chorus says, there will be one name that I proclaim. So I just wanted all of us actually to read Philippians uh, 2, 6 to 11 all together. So you'll see it up on the screen, the screen, and uh, <laughs> we see a screen that way. Um, but uh, why don't you read with us? So let's read together. Who, Who being, being in, in very nature, nature God, God, did not, not consider, consider equality with God, God something, something to, to be used, used to his own advantage. advantage. Rather, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking, taking the very nature of a servant. servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thank you. 
here when his people praise him. I, I think before we're seated, I, I think it would be cool for us, us to do something that we don't normally do here. Uh, I'd like us, because our, the, the room has resounded with the praises of the king, and I think that's all uh, worship that he receives, but I think he also receives our prayers. And I would like us to just have a, an out loud prayer time, just for a minute. Uh, where we all pray out loud together and we say to God three things that we are praising him for today. What makes him great in your mind? So, so don't worry about the person beside you. I just think it's gonna kind of be a choir of prayer. Can we try this? All right? So just for a moment, just out loud, just tell God what makes him great to you. Let's pray. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I was pretty neat. Well, it's great to have you here this morning. We're delighted. Uh, as I often say in the summer, we're delighted to have anybody here this morning. It's just so beautiful, and, uh, and it's holiday time, and people are out and about, and, uh, and all over the place. <sighs> Daryl, where are you sitting? Yeah, okay, so Daryl Bendel and his family are here. Daryl was one of my youth leaders in, when I was a youth pastor in Ontario. I mean, it's great to have you here. Wow. I'm so old and dumpy, I hardly recognize him. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to invite the ushers to come to the front and join me. If you would, please, we're going to receive an offering this morning. Um, and uh, I did want to say, you know what, uh, uh, financially as a church, um, if our giving through the rest of the prime time could be as good as it's been in the summer, uh, you know, I just might do a dance in the front. I, I, it's, been, it's been great. It's been great. And... Uh, Look, let's pray out loud first and then we'll work with the dancing thing. 
Um, but uh, thank you, thank you for your consistent giving here. Uh, uh, we're trying to do some things for the kingdom, and uh, and often it requires funds to do so. So thank you, thank you for your consistent giving. Now, um, are Sawatskis here today? I don't, they're not here today. Okay, I just wanted to remind you, um, Alan and Mary Sawatsky have been volunteering at Stillwood Camp for a decade, a decade. And today, uh, they're, they, they usually just sit right back here and uh, uh, a retired couple, and they sort of thought, how can, we make some, how can we make some kingdom mileage as a retired couple? So they have worked up at Stillwood Camp with all those kids for a decade. Would that not drive you mad? They have served the Lord that way, and uh, they, there is a, uh, there's an afternoon tea for them at Steelwood Camp today at 2 o'clock. If you uh, wish to go up there and celebrate with, with them, that would be great. They are, they are on their way to move to Kelowna, and uh, so we're going to miss them. But uh, anyway, God bless them. They have, uh, wow, wow, they put feet to their, feet to their faith. I also hear that uh, Chad, and uh, Chad and Angela are not here today, but uh, Angela had a little boy yesterday. And, uh, and uh, Angela is in a walking cast. She broke her ankle, so, so Chad has to do all the bouncing. It's fantastic. <laughs> but we, we, praise God to, we praise God for that as well. All right, I think, um, I think we're going to pray and dedicate this offering to the Lord's business. And uh, after I have prayed, uh, children, you can be dismissed to your children's church. Our children's church has been rocking and rolling this summer. Where did all the kids come from? We're not sure, but you'll have a great time up in children's church. So you can go after I have prayed. So let's pray together. How great you are, O God. And we, together with God's people, testify to that truth. Uh, you have proved yourself faithful in our lives in the past, and uh, we looked to you to prove yourself faithful again. Thank you for your faithfulness to this church congregation that has been here almost 70 years, and we have counted you our Lord and Master and have found you faithful. Now, Lord, would you take these offerings? They represent the sweat of our brow, uh, really, it's, it's, a, it's the, often the teeth of worship. And so would you take these gifts and multiply them so that all you want us to do as a church, we could do. We, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you. Thank you for leading us. Some actually were moved to tears. Her son. <laughs> Leon, don't ruin the moment. What? Nice to have my Uncle Dean and Lucille here today in church. And... Uh, he sang tenor and I sang bass and we had a great little choir there. It's good, it's good. Take your Bibles today, will you? And uh, go to the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew. We're gonna be looking, if you're using the Bible in front of you in the pew, we're on page 738. Uh, Matthew chapter 25. We're gonna spend just a couple of minutes there. Matthew chapter 25. Uh, some of you are on vacation here today. We are delighted to have you here and uh, have you, uh, if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to, uh, to park here and uh, throw your weight in behind what this congregation is trying to do. Uh, we've been asking some questions all summer. Our series has been called, I Have a Question. And uh, so we're going to ask another question today. Uh, but I've changed our question for today. Uh, Friday was my father's funeral. And uh, the flowers here are from that funeral. Uh, my father is a longtime Alliance pastor and former senior pastor here and uh, spent many years in our, in our church congregation. And uh, so over the past while, I have been reflecting on his life and his ministry. Uh, he was a pastor from his late uh, 20s until just a few year years ago. And so I, I'm changing our question for today, and I'm going to ask the question, why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? Uh, why did my father do what he did? Why do we as Christians do what we do? And uh, so I'm just going to, uh, uh, and we're, I think we're going to um, touch on this passage again during our primetime year, but so I don't want to delve into it too um, deeply uh, at this point, but I'd like us to springboard off of this passage today. So uh, this is the teaching of Jesus, and he's teaching on, on uh, what, is, what is valuable as far as God's kingdom is concerned. Uh, and he gives a number of parables or stories to amplify what is important to God and what should be important to God's people. So uh, follow uh, in chapter 25, verse 14 uh, in, in uh, our time today. Again, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. And to one he gave five talents, that's a monetary designation. Uh, to one he gave five talents of money. To another two talents and to another one talent, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey, and the man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Um, so also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. <laughs> and after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents, and see, I have gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. The five talents were a few things. It's a few things. I will put you in charge of many things, or as another version says, come and be a partner with me. Come and share your master's happiness. And so too with the man who, who was given two talents. He doubled his, his uh, uh, in investment as well and received the same uh, encouragement from the master. And then the third one, you know, who had dug, dug a hole and, and put it in. And uh, you know what it's like if you, if you put a, a bag in the ground here in Chilliwack for a long time. And uh, so he brought it to the master blowing it off and showing what was left of the bag. And you remember, the master was extremely displeased 
Uh, and the, it's interesting, we'll talk about this another time, but the, the, the servant said, I didn't invest it because I was afraid of you. And the master said, no, you're not afraid, you're wicked and lazy. Interesting. And uh, so he cast him out, and he was not a partner with him uh, in his business. So, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, the bag, the, the bag containing the talents uh, is something that every Christian receives from the master. So, God is the master, and we are the servants. That's Jesus teaching, and, we, and, and that's the application of his teaching. So, so the master has given you and me a bag uh, filled with things that he wants us to invest, and that bag is called your calling. He goes away and entrusts us with a bag of, if you can call it a talents, maybe euros or whatever. I'm saying it's units. Gives you a bag of, and there's a number of units in the bag. And according to ability, he gives some people a large bag and some a smaller bag to invest. So that bag, and if you're a Christian today, God has given you a a bag with units in it uh, to invest on his behalf. So it contains everything you have that you could invest for eternal purposes. So some people sitting in the room here, uh, you know, there's so many jokes you can run around with bags, so let's just try to not think of those. Um, Some have a large bag with investment units, and some people sitting in the room here, God has given you, God has given you a full bag. It's a heavy bag, lots of things for you to invest. So maybe you have many children, Maybe you have many children. Children are your, are your heritage, potentially. Well, they are your heritage for good or ill. M- maybe you have many children. That's, that's part of the bag that you've been given. Maybe, maybe you have lot, a lot of money, or maybe you have considerable physical resources. Those are part of the bag that the master has entrusted to you. Maybe you have many abilities. Maybe you, can, maybe you can sing and dance. Maybe you can play the xylophone like an angel. I don't know what. But you have abilities, and those are in that bag. You are a five-talent person. You are a five-unit person. You have a large bag that the master has asked you on his behalf to invest. Others in this room have a smaller bag entrusted to them by the master. Maybe, maybe the influence that you have is only with a few people. and that's, that's part of what is in your bag. Maybe you only have one spiritual gift. Maybe you're not mul- multiple gifted. You just have one spiritual gift that's in your bag. Maybe, maybe you are a person that has very little time. Your time is all used up by the other cares of your life. You only have a little bit of time precious to invest for Jesus' sake. That is in your bag. You perhaps are a one talent or a one unit person. You have a smaller bag. So some of you in this room have a large bag. Some of you have a small bag. The number of investment units in your bag is not your decision. It's the master's decision. He looks at you, he knows you, he's known you before you were born. He knows what he can entrust you with and so he gives you a size of bag. Don't worry about, don't worry about the size of the bag and don't wish now, you can always take xylophone lessons, but don't, don't worry about people who have things that you wish you had and maybe can't have. That's not your decision. Um, so if you're a terrible singer, but you know how to make money, then invest that ability for the master's sake and don't worry about the fact that you can't sing well. Now, the, the, the bag that, that the master has given you, be it small or large, everyone has one, but small or large, we often call this concept in Christian circles calling, your calling from God. Uh, Every Christian has a calling from God. The calling is the contents of the bag. 
That's your calling. Uh, and he entrusts it to you and me. They are the units of investment you find inside. And as you open it, he expects you to invest those for kingdom purposes. That's what Jesus teaches here. So think about some Bible callings or some, if you wish, some Bible bags. Think about, think about the calling for Noah. God gave him a bag and it was the future of the human race. It's a big one, it's a big one. Build an ark for there is incoming judgment. Uh, think of Moses who had a calling and we think about his calling particularly in Exodus 3 which we won't go to today but, but uh, think about the huge bag that God had entrusted Moses with. The, the, the leading out of the children of Israel from bondage to freedom to the promised land. It was a huge calling and God had entrusted him with, with the finest education that Egypt could offer uh, with learning how to run a, a, a sheep flock, learning all about the desert that they would be in for 40 years. And Moses said, don't call me because I'm not a good speaker. A good speaker was not part of his bag. All the rest was part of his bag. And God said, okay, fine, I'll get you a speaker. You should not complain to me about what's in your bag. You just need to invest it. I think about Jonah. Was there ever a more stubborn man in the Bible than Jonah? Think about that. God says to him, I want you to go to Nineveh. And, and, Nineveh sa- and, and Jonah says, no. Not only does he say no, but he runs the other way. Gets on a boat. Remember, Jonah is a desert boy. So when he gets on a boat to go across the Mediterranean, he really means it. And you know the rest of that story. But really, what was one of the core things in Jonah's bag? He was, he was uh, maybe, maybe his bag was mostly made up of grit. Because that was Jonah. And he went in, when he finally decided to obey, he went into Nineveh. For three days, he told them they were all going to die. You know, these were, the, these were the rapers and pillagers of the day. And Jonah goes, when Jonah got a mind to, he could do anything for God. Uh, Jeremiah, God said, you know what's in your bag? He said, I'm gonna make you into a wall. They can bang on you all they want and they'll never get in. I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna make you tough. That's part of your bag. Think about, the, think about the disciples. He said, I want you to leave everything and follow me. And he, and he put different things in each of their bags. Peter could preach. Peter, when he was filled with the Spirit, he could sway people to come to Jesus. It was powerful in that way. Or James. James could organize. He ran the Jerusalem church. He was a good organizer. Or, or Matthew. Matthew could write. We read from him this morning. And so each one of those disciples had something in their bag. Think about, think about Saul, who became Paul, uh, who was in who encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. Saul or Paul had one of the biggest bags, I think, ever. Powerful, trained by Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had a huge bag of talents. He was an orator. He was a huge brain, but he loved Jesus with all his heart. He was stubborn as an ox. Uh, he, he could take beatings like nobody ever could take beatings and, and survive them. Paul had a huge bag that was invested for Jesus' sake, upon his conversion. And all through the Bible, people were called to invest the units in the bag that God entrusted to them. Think a little bit about history. We think about the Emperor Constantine, and uh, we've talked about him a little bit before, and uh, through a circuitous route and through being in, uh, part of his bag was that he was an excellent, excellent Uh, he could wage war well. And uh, he became emperor of the Roman Empire about the same time that he was converted to Christ. He was 42 years old. He'd been a pagan all his life. His mom had witnessed to him, but he'd been a pagan. And he became a Christian at age 42. Now, (laughs) believe me, Constantine was a flawed vessel. He would never make our elders board here. But, but in taking steps to make Christianity in the early 300s the religion of the Roman Empire, he said, 
I do so with a sense of calling from God. And so he invested his many units in the bag of power and brilliance and influence. He invested them for Christ's sake. And we, we still call the Catholic Church the Roman Catholic Church. That comes from Constantine's time in the 300s. I think about our founder, uh, Albert Benjamin Simpson. Uh, he was raised in a Christian home, and uh, he, was, he, 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 he came to Christ in his mid-teens, but even as a small child, he felt that in his bag, he, he had to preach. Just a kid. He'd stand on the coffee table, you know? And this wasn't even a Christian yet. But he felt in his bag was the ability to preach. And when he came to know Jesus as Lord, he never looked back. That guy had a big bag, many units to invest. He was a powerful orator. He was a, the guy had energy to burn. He was a firebrand for God. And so much happened with regard to touching the world with missions from our founder who invested what was in his bag. Right to the end of his life. Billy Graham. Billy Graham grew up on a dairy farm. He was busy milking cows. And at 16 years old, he came to know Jesus and eventually went to Bob Jones University and was goofing off. He's just fooling around. And a leader at the school there said, not in these many words, but essentially, he said, Billy, you are wasting your life. You're gonna end up being a, 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 a little church Baptist preacher in some backwater hole, and he said, you were made for more than that because you have a voice it's in his bag. The voice of Billy Graham saw more people come to know Jesus than anybody else in this last century. And Billy said, he says, that he received his calling by God on the 18th green of the Temple Terrace Golf and Country Club in Temple Terrace, Florida. That's where he got his calling, he said. Obviously, how poor a golfer he was. And uh, it's interesting to me, and I have never been there, but it's interesting to me that there is a memorial park right beside the 18th hole to commemorate that calling. That's where, that's where he said, I, I am going to invest, I'm going to invest this bag, all these units that God has given me for, for the master. I'm going to invest it. And he did that, has done that all his life. Imagine, imagine if Billy Graham would have buried the bag that God gave him. Imagine. I think about our own church, and uh, I'm going to invite three of our staff members to come up at this time, if you would. Uh, George and Holly and Mark, if you would come. Uh, Holly, if you'd sit here, and George here, and Mark there. That would be great. So on Thursday, we had a funeral in our church for Irene Lowen. Uh, Irene has been a part of our congregation for many, many years. And uh, she was a gal who, she, she received Jesus as a child, but but had no assurance of salvation. It's pa very interesting what Pastor Ray said this morning, that you know, what really affects him is to know that, that, that uh, God loves him unconditionally, and Irene didn't know that. And so Irene was getting saved every week. Come down to the front, get saved, then she'd go on Monday and she'd fall, then she'd be mad and frustrated and upset, and as a teenager she said, you know what, I'm done with this Christian thing. And a friend of hers just happened to spend time with her and talk to her about how it's not up to you to remain saved. It's up to Jesus to hold you in his hand. It's beautiful. She found out about that, and she never looked back. And so she worked her whole life, and, and the burning desire from that encounter was to let the world know that Jesus not only saves you, but he keeps you. So she devoted her life to that. She taught, she, she went to normal school and taught all over the place, but that was part of her teaching. So she taught in Manitoba, she taught at Prairie Bible uh, 
elementary school. She taught in Bella Coola. Uh, and then, but you know, she, she had this thing in her bag and it was, it was a hunger for Japan. Japan. So she went to post-war Japan. Remember, you know, mushroom cloud and all that kind of stuff? As a single lady, she learned Japanese and she spent 30 years there investing what God had put in her bag. That's a gal from our church. That's a gal from our church. I think about my dad who was saved as a 12-year-old. And, uh, and uh, when, when, he, when he was saved, er, everybody, everybody went to Peace River Bible Institute for one year. That was up in the Grand Prairie area in Alberta. And so he went there, he went there, and it was post-war. It was the late 40s, right? So all those Bible Institutes at the time, I remember, I, I think, I, I tried to look it up on Google, but couldn't find it, but I remember as a kid when I would go to the Prairie Bible Institute, or Peace River Bible Institute, their, their logo was a, was a hand holding a torch. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, let's conquer. Let's go and reach the world. So, so my dad, uh, who by the way, as a, as a insular Norwegian, it's amazing what Bible school does to all that stuff. He met an insular Mennonite. <laughs> and uh, sparks happened and, and, uh, and, uh, Dad didn't listen through a lot of the lectures and all that, and they got married. But my mother felt called to be a missionary. Always did, to India. She wanted to go to India. And, uh, and uh, it's interesting, to the, to the very last of her life, uh, they lived up on Yale here where Sikh workers would be planting the fields, and my mom would stand at the window and she would pray for each of those Sikh workers because they're Indian. Did that all her life. So they got married, and then they felt a calling. They felt a calling was in their bag, and they had, they had some gifts, and so they went to the west coast of Vancouver Island to Tofino. So these are, these are prairie kids from the farm in Grand Prairie, and they went down to Tofino, and they worked with the shantymen on a little boat that would go up and down the coast, ministering to fishing villages and Indian villages along the way, where Irene Lowen was working, by the way, right around that time and dad hated it. And so, two years later, he quit. He said, fine, I've done, the, I've done the church thing, I'm gonna go back and make some money. So he went back to Grand Prairie, started to make some money. Really, the only good thing that happened in Tofino is that I was conceived there. <laughs> but, but God kept bugging my dad. He said, I have given you a bag. I've given you abilities, and I want you to invest them, not for you, but for me. It bugged him. It bugged him. And through a series of circumstances, Dad went back into pastoral ministry, and he served with distinction through his entire life. Uh, And I I think the key unit, uh, aside from, from faithfulness and a lack of ego, was an entrepreneurial spirit. I think that's really what took my dad through to a, a wildly successful career in churches. He was, he was I, I've always joked, dad would hire staff, and his motto, he never said it out loud, was catch me if you can. He just went like a whirling dervish. What if, what if he wouldn't have invested the bag that God gave him? We just saw Don and Betty Orr go back to Poland. Their kids don't live in Poland. They live here. Uh, They are the only alliance missionaries in that entire nation. And they just left our church to go back there. Uh, Bob and Carol Massey from our church, their daughter and and her husband and their grandkids just left for Africa this summer. Uh, And so many tears because the family is very close. So they're going to Burundi. They're in Burundi. But... There was great affirmation through the tears. Why? Because they're investing. They're investing the bag that God has given them. In the last three years, individuals in our church have each given between $50,000 and a million dollars to church and missions efforts, both locally in our church and outside. 
in the last three years. This week, a group of women in our kitchen, because Irene's service was on Thursday and my dad's service was on Friday, a group of women came early in the morning and worked long volunteer hours for two days to serve two bereaved families, one of them mine. Why do they do that? Right now, as we sit in palatial splendor in this room, there are people working with our kids. They're missing the service today. They're working with our kids up in the kids' wing, and there are people patrolling the lot so nobody will break into your car. They are missing the service today. Why are they doing that? Because they are investing what they sense God has put into their bag. That's why. That's why we do what we do. So I'd like to, I'd like to talk uh, with staff a little bit. And uh, this is a representation of our fine staff. And uh, you know, Holly just got back from China. And uh, Holly, you, you, uh, you obviously grew up in a clergy home. Nope. You, d- you didn't grow up in a Christian home? No. So, so when you went to Bible camp, because you got a chance to go to Bible camp, right? Yeah, a friend invited me. Yeah. I wanted to learn how to water ski. And uh, <laughs> what, did you know, what did you know about Christianity when you went to the Bible camp? Um, I, I didn't know anything. <laughs> that was like, what do you mean? Um... Well, I kind of knew who some of the pieces were in nativity scenes because my mom had one, but we kept moving all the pieces around because it bugged her. That's about all I knew. I knew there was a Mary and a, and a baby. That's it. <laughs> and you knew the cows and the camels also. Oh, yeah, and the sheep. Mm-hmm. Good, good. And sheep. Um, so so you, come out of a, you come out of a setting where you have a great family, but Christ is not the center. And you, you, you come to know... Jesus through, through a series of circumstances, what has been your approach to how you invest that bag that God has given to you? Um, well, I think at first I didn't know what else to do. Like it, it just, it made sense to just try out different things because um, opportunities kind of came across my path and it, um, it was, I just didn't know to do anything else. Um, I, I had a chance to go to Bible school and there was, so many different opportunities, and um, I just, yeah, I guess I didn't really know to do anything else, and then after, after th- some things kind of became clear, I, again, I just, opportunities and things just kind of keep coming in front of me, and I, I don't really have a good reason to say no, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. so. So in your bag, really, is just to be open to opportunity. I think so, and flexibility, but yeah, I just, why not? <laughs> so. Interesting. So you take opportunities if there's really no reason to say no. Mostly, yep. Wow. Good. Thank you. George. Now, George, you grew up in a pastor's home. Mm, nope. You, d- you didn't grow up? Uh, as far as I know, I'm the only Christian in my family. What? Yep. Well, keep praying for him, folks, please. So you're from a non- non-Christian family. like Very nominal you know, Sunday school occasionally, Easter, Christmas, stuff like that. Like, did you listen to rock and roll music? Tell um, me no. I was a thrash medalist <laughs> in the mosh pits of Europe, yeah. Sorry, folks. I'm still debating on whether I should get my earring back in or not. <laughs> so, to you, so to you, ACDC is not an electrical designation. ACDC were like pop music in comparison to what I listened to, yeah. <laughs> Wow. So, so then, but, but you, had, you had something that was rotating in your life spiritually before you came to know Jesus. Yeah, I became a Christian. I was converted at, uh, just before I was at the age of 21. Um, but ever since I can remember, going back to when I was a young boy, certainly definitely when I was a teenager, I was always drawn to and fascinated by uh, Russia. And so I, my mom and dad did put me in the boys' brigade when I was a kid. And I remember going through that. And when I was doing my Queen's badge, my, sort of the final sort of stage, uh, there's this booklet you have to fill in. And then there it says, if you could spread the boys' brigade to any country in the world where it currently isn't, where would that be and why? And so then I put in, I would spread it to Russia because 
you know, people, their need structure and help and better things to live for. That was a time of um, Gorbachev, Reagan and Gorbachev and Perestroika. Wow. So I was fascinated by the history and the culture. Um, yeah, everything about that country. So how did it work then after you came to know Jesus that you actually went to Russia as a, as a church leader? Yeah, uh, there was, this is just like after the Berlin Wall came down um, and uh, Yeltsin took over. Uh, there were a couple of Russians who got converted in our church and came to our church camp in England. And I volunteered to be responsible to look after them. Yeah. Um, and then about a year later, I was joining them. <laughs> so, yeah, watch out what you volunteer for. <sighs> so, yeah, I, I, the opportunity came up. Yeah, there was two very small church groups, house groups. There was three people in Moscow and about seven people in a town called Viborg on the border of Russia and Finland. So I moved to Viborg and, and uh, dived in. And really, uh, your time in Russia was a story both of privation but also amazing provision, hey? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It yeah. was incredible. It was four years there. So, so Holly, Holly comes from a home, uh, a loving home, but she finds Christ through other people investing their bag. And then she, part of the bag that she has is I'm flexible, I'm open, I'm looking for opportunity, and I walk, through, I walk through doors as they open. George is from a nominal home, a loving home, but a nominal home, but in his heart, in his bag, is placed a love for Russia as a child, as a child, before he's even a Christian. And it ends up that he goes to Russia and he's a church planter in that place. Now Mark, uh, Please tell me you're raised in a Christian home. I was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Mark, I, I think what's interesting to me about your calling, because you were raised in the Anglican Church. That's right, yeah. Yeah. What, what I find very interesting is that, is that you had a sense that you should be a pastor, and then that changed over circumstances. Mm. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that process? I can. Look at my wife. So on my honeymoon, <laughs> I, I keep it PG. Okay, yeah. Um, on my honeymoon, I felt a calling to uh, full-time ministry in the church. I shared that with my wife on my honeymoon. She wasn't. It's best too late. She's married now. Yeah, she wasn't best pleased. Anyway, we've been married 30 years. You all, so all is good. So all went on. So everything went fine there. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I felt called then. So after talking through with Angela, we wrestled for a, quite a while, uh, you know, what should happen. And uh, after uh, lots of testing, and as I say, many are called, few are chosen. I felt called to full-time ministry. Uh, eventually, I ended up training in the Church of England to be what's known as a, a, a reader, a, a preaching pastor. So each week I go out and I preach in, in different churches. Um, and I think as my callings unfold over the years, I really did feel that sense of full-time ministry, but that really wasn't where God was calling me. God was actually calling me to live full-time in ministry, yes, but partly in the church and partly um, in the working world. And so I've spent all my, really, most of my adult life, uh, since I've been married, you know, serving in the church and working in business as well. So you have... Part of your bag is to, is to exalt Christ within the church and also in the business community. That's right. Wow. That's a great, that's a great calling. So, so now Holly serves our church part-time in the area of youth and missions. George serves in our church full-time wearing many hats, including young adults and pastoral care and care groups. And Mark has a business, and then he also serves us as our executive pastor. They are, they are investing what God has put into their bag. I think it's, it's awesome to see how that works, and I would like you to thank them for coming here today. Thank you. Why do we do what we do? 
because we've each been entrusted with a bag containing units for investment for the king of kings. That's why we do it. And we know that he will return and want to know how we have used them. So as I close this morning, it was a shocker to hear about Robin Williams this past week. And uh, we don't know all the details there and, uh, and not passing judgment except to say that fulfillment is not found in taking the bag of talents and spending them on yourself. How many times do we have to see this portrayed in our society for us to learn that? Fulfillment is found in looking at the, inside the bag to see the units that God has entrusted me to invest for his kingdom's sake and doing so. It brings fulfillment and joy. For God's kingdom is the only kingdom that will last. I'm going to invite the gals to come up, if you would, and just get ready. So this past week, uh, I, I had my vehicle in for repair. And my vehicle, the, the repair person that I have is just on the other side of the tracks here off of Young. So I drop it off in the morning, I walk to the church, I work at the church, and then I walk back and pick up my vehicle. And uh, so this, this week, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm getting ready for two funerals, and we had a full staff planning day, and we had 60 relatives to our house for supper, and you know, I don't have a lot of time. I'm walking up young to get my vehicle, and sure enough, the train. Not the fast train. You know those blue ones? And I, even, the, even the horn is slow. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking up young, and I get up to the train, and he's going, <laughs> and he grinds to a stop right across the tracks. Traffic, heat simmering off of their hoods on both sides. I'm the only pedestrian. And uh, I'm standing there, they're all waiting, you know, turning around, swearing. <laughs> and, uh, and I look down, and you know what? About six cars down there was the end of the train. And I thought, you know what? If I pound this thing, I can get around this thing. <laughs> and so I did. Well, you know what? The raspberry, the blackberry bushes are growing right up to the train. <laughs> so I'm running, I'm running around the train and the blackberries are grabbing my stuff and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? I scampered down there and I got around that train and I went and got my car. I felt really good. <laughs> and you know, I thought about that with regard to accomplishing God's will for our life. Because your life is like going down young, young road. And you have a destination. And that, that destination is an appointment with the master. And you know, as we continue down that road, sometimes things come in the way. And they stop us from continuing on the course that God has called us to. I ask you today, what is God's desire for you and what stands in the way of it being accomplished? What cares of life have come into your life that are keeping you from investing the bag that God has given to you, little or big? How are you investing what he has entrusted to you? Have you buried those gifts somewhere? Are you standing at the train and letting it stop you from investing those gifts for his sake? Or will you scamper around the back of that train and keep going? At some point in the future, you and I will stand before the master and we will answer for how we have invested the gifts he has entrusted to us. You know what I'm looking for? Looking for one thing. 
It's not how big my bag was. Or I, I think if that last guy would have invested his bag and lost it all, I think he still would have got encouragement from the master. I'm looking for well done, good and faithful servant. Come and be a partner with me. You have been faithful in little things. Now I'm going to put you in charge of big things. Don't you want that? What a waste if we take the bag and blow it on this world which will pass away. We're going to hear a song about that place where we are headed. We're headed. It's, it's an eternal place. It's a place of fulfillment. Irene knows that place. My dad knows that place. Let's think about it as the ladies sing for us. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. Yeah, 
This world seems so overwhelmingly real sometimes, and the next so thin and far away. And Jesus says into this, don't forget the master. You as a congregation, so many of you, small bag, large bag, are investing, investing. Only heaven, only the master knows the extent of what is occurring from your investment. It may never show here. This is not the important world. The reward is important. So, uh, we, I, I did wanna say, uh, if you would like to spend some time in prayer, before you leave here today, we always have friends who will pray with you and they'll be at the front of the, of the sanctuary here. And uh, if you have a burden uh, or you have nobody to rejoice with, you, you, you go there. We have prayer people, they love this kind of thing. It's part of their bag. And uh, so we'd, we'd, love, we'd love you to do that. But let me pray for you and, uh, and just, just invite the Lord to work in your life even as we leave. So Heavenly Father, Thank you for caring enough about your children to entrust us with something. And Lord, there's no guarantee as to how successful we will be uh, in this world, and yet we just do our best to invest what we sense you've given to us for your kingdom's sake. Uh, we have seen that all through the Bible. We've seen it all through history We've seen it through the history of our church and we see it happening today in our church and we bless you for it. Be with each one as they look deeper into the bag and, and uh, as they ask you how to invest what you have given. Thank you for the staff that you have given to us and each of them has a testimony of how they've come to this point of investment. So Lord, use us and we, we're just finishing off the summer here but we're coming to prime time and Lord, we just want... We just want so much to be used of you individually and corporately to be all that you'd have us to be. That brings, wow, that brings a sense of fulfillment. So bless your people, I pray, this week and bless our efforts on your behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming, everybody.